This is the Teachable Soul Podcast. Because we cannot possibly live long enough to make all the mistakes ourselves, let's take a few moments to learn from the mistakes of others. The Teachable Soul Podcast, where guests and listeners like you share stories of failure and teachable moments on the journey to success. Here's your host, Kat Daniels. Welcome to the Teachable Soul Podcast. I am your host, Kat Daniels, and today with me, I have the pleasure of interviewing Mr. Tyler Christensen, who is a teacher, author, speaker, entrepreneur, and family man. He has spent 15 years in classrooms as an elementary, middle school, and university instructor. Tyler is currently the founder of a national recruiting service for student athletes, an academic journal for those preparing to teach, and a web design firm specializing in celebrity websites. He has published two books and will publish his third this year, Unlocking the Power of Transformation. Tyler recently lost 100 pounds and went from not being able to run a mile without walking in 2018 to completing a double marathon in 2019. When he's not teaching, working on his businesses, or training for a race, Tyler is doing his most important work, which is spending time with his incredible wife and four amazing kids. He also runs a podcast and a YouTube channel. Welcome, Tyler. Thanks. Good to be here. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming. Um, So do you want to, where would you like to start? (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, honestly, what I've been thinking about lately is COVID stuff. You know, what I've done in the last two months, when we first touched uh, base, it was a few months ago before any of this craziness happened. And it's funny when you read that bio off, it's like, oh, I haven't worked on any of those things for the last two months because my life has totally shifted. Um, Right, as has most of ours. (laughs) So I'll I'll go wherever you want to with it, but my my life is certainly different now than it was a little while ago. Right. Well, I was very excited to speak to you specifically about at least teaching during this time because I have not gotten to speak to a teacher other than my children's own teachers, and they seem just as frustrated as I am. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) do you want to share your take on that as a teacher? Yeah. So I I think this has been an amazing and a horrible and a wonderful time, depending on how prepared you were for it and, and what kind of situation you're in. And obviously there's a lot that's happening that's beyond our control. So for example, I have four children, two are in middle school. So as a parent of students, I'm dealing with 17 different teachers teaching in 17 different ways with different expectations. And, and, you know, of course, that's frustrating for everyone involved, not just me as a parent, not just my kids, but I'm sure the Mm -hmm. teachers are are struggling too. Um, On the teaching side of that, so we actually just ended school this last week. Um, But prior to this last week, my daily schedule was wake up at four, work on my own things, um, get all my teaching stuff together, be done with that by eight so that I can support my, my children in their learning till noon. Then I hop back into the classroom, the virtual classroom at noon to double check with things with my students and prepare for the next day. And then usually I would wrap up mid afternoon, which was wonderful um, because then I'd have time to work on other projects. And so Mm. as a teacher, I actually loved that schedule because it was more, I could control it, right? I could control when I was doing things, I could still get everything done and more. So I was creating online resources, filming instructional videos for my students, how to do their math, stuff like Mm -hmm. that. And it was stuff that I'm benefiting from now as a teacher, but I can also use those resources in the future. So I really loved kind of this hybrid online model of being able to create things that help my students now, but will help them in the future. Mm -hmm. But in, in our school, we had, we were fortunate in that, um, my principal decided let's get rid of all the non-essentials and just focus on the things that are critical for helping them move on to next year. So really focused on math and reading and, and, got rid of a lot of other stuff. We didn't even do spelling for the last few months. We, we did very little social studies um, and really focused on the essential things to move forward. And so in, in that regard, my teaching load actually got easier. Um, and it, that doesn't mean I worked less. It meant that I was able to put my energy into 
to communicating with students. I would drive books to their houses and, um, you know, check in with Zoom chats so that we could talk to each other and things like that. So it was a really weird time the last two months. Uh, and in some ways, it was wonderful. Some of my students really thrived in an online environment. Some really struggled and are dealing with stress and anxiety. And that's why I created um, the virtual school assembly so I could bring in motivational speakers and, and experts on mental and physical health to share inspirational messages with them. So that's where I spent all my extra time was creating programs for my students and for students anywhere that want to take advantage of that to, to have COVID specific messages on. These are things we can do to stay positive during this time, to get ahead during this time, and to really thrive. And so that's where I've been spending my time and energy and I, it's been wonderful. I've loved it. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I love online learning for myself. That's I thrive in that you know arena as well. Um, but teaching my mm -hmm. kids while they are online learning because I have a first grader and a middle schooler has not been right. what I dreamed it would be. <laughs> <laughs> of course, yeah. yeah. I, and I've experienced something similar. I taught, so I was a professor for ten years, and through graduate school, I took a few online courses. That was back in the dinosaur days, where it was a brand new thing of of taking a course right. online. But my my first graduate degree was in educational technology, so I, I took a few online courses. And then when I was a professor, I taught a few online courses, and I found that uh, as a an instructor, I loved it because I could control the framework, the content, uh, it could be super organized, I could make sure they were getting everything they needed, and then spend all my time with discussion groups and making sure I had that one-on-one -on -one connection. Mm -hmm. But what happened during COVID-19 is teachers were thrust into this. So none of that organization was in place. We were just learning on the fly. And so it's just a hard situation for all teachers. Now, I think it'll be a different story come fall. Who knows if we'll be in classrooms or not. But if we're not, teachers will be much better prepared at that point. For sure. Yeah. And another thing that I worry about is I've noticed, so um, my daughter's first grade teacher mentioned mm -hmm. that the, so all of the, the assignments that they receive for first grade are standard throughout the entire district. So every single first grader is receiving the exact same assignment. Um, and initially mm -hmm. it was poorly done. They were expecting first graders to write whole paragraphs basically, or type rather whole paragraphs um, right. in answer to questions that they didn't understand some of the words to and things. Now they've somehow been able to loosen that a little bit and we're able to provide pictures and, and far more understanding just in the assignments themselves because before they weren't even for our district anyways they weren't even doing um like google meets before the assignment um or videos or anything like that so i mean it's definitely progressed right. and gotten better as we've gone on um but i'm still terrified honestly if we don't go back if they don't go back next year <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you know it is a scary proposition i do think things will improve even if they we do go back online but i think um you know schools this is a real opportunity for education because we've been teaching in the same way and learning in the same kinds of ways for the last hundred years mm -hmm. uh in schools but in the real world, we don't learn in those same right. ways if we want to learn something we go to youtube we listen to podcasts mm -hmm. we go talk to experts. We work, we get that experiential learning. And I think this is an opportunity for some educational reform where we're saying, look, let's get rid of some of those horrible components of, of lecture in the classroom and not hands-on. And we've been forced in this online env environment to be a little more creative and to think outside the box. And I think some awesome things are going to come from that. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I cannot wait for that part of it. <laughs> It's um, yeah. it definitely needed done. And it was, you know, everybody was like, oh, we can't do that. It's it's it would be too much change too quickly and too hard. And, and then they were forced to do it anyway. So <laughs> yeah. that worked out, which is awesome because it wouldn't have happened mm -hmm. otherwise. And I think being forced into it was a real opportunity um, just for education in yeah. general. Yeah, I completely agree. So is your book still coming out this summer or has it been delayed? It has been delayed. Um, so I actually finished writing it last year and then was going to do a, a spring release. And then I got accepted for a TED Talk uh, in San Francisco. And so I I delayed the release of the book until I, it was going to be May. Um, so I could get through the TED Talk and, and, and work on some different things that I, I was doing. And then 
as I was actually traveling to go to San Francisco for my talk, that one got canceled. So that was right at the beginning of COVID. Mm -hmm. And, and during that time, you know, I went home and I ate ice cream and I soaked for a while. Right. And then I thought, well, what can I do during this time? And that's when I got the idea for virtual school assembly. And I've put all my energy into that. So everything in my own life has been put on hold. I, I, I paused the book. Um, I've paused some other projects that I'm working on. And yes, I hope to do it this summer. I'm wrapping up virtual school assembly season one right now. I recorded 50 episodes in a month. So I was crazy busy with wow. that. Um, but as that wraps up, now I'll, I'll revisit that. I don't have a date set for the book, but I'll, it'll probably come out late June, as I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. So what is virtual school assembly about? It, so it's just, I've, I've gone to um, celebrities, professional athletes, professional speakers, uh, and educators from around the world, and asked them to share messages of inspiration, uh, encouragement, and, and educating students on things relevant to COVID-19. So how to take care of their mental health, how to get um, exercise even when they're stuck at home, how to find new opportunities. I've had a bunch of um, Hollywood actors and directors talk about storytelling and how to create videos, um, how to get into podcasting. So I've had a few podcast hosts on. And, and then I've had a bunch of superintendents and principals talk about what they're seeing in their schools and, and how their students have adjusted and adapted. So it's just short messages, like each episode's about 20 minutes. Um, and it's been really cool. You know, um, next week we have a few um, uh, NBA basketball players on. This, I think, tomorrow, or actually it might be today at 10, um, we're having a new episode with Mark Pattison, who was a, a – NFL wide receiver for a bunch of years and now he's summiting the seven highest mountains in the world and he had to delay his Everest trip which was supposed to be right now mm -hmm. um, for next year because of COVID so it's just hearing cool stories from people who have you know gone through uncertainty in their life gone through a lot of change and have really turned things around to turn that into a positive so um, you know they're very customized episodes for this time. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's kind of like my podcast, but you, I don't usually do like celebrities or big things like that. My my whole deal is like regular people like us. So <laughs> yeah, right. so that's awesome. Yep. Yeah, no, I've I've listened to several of your shows and I've I've enjoyed hearing, you know, different perspectives from from people like me. So it's I, I enjoy your podcast. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I can't wait to listen to yours. I know yours is after the run. Um, and I don't yet run because I'm in a situation right now where you were in where you can't I mm -hmm. can't run a mile. So <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, and the whole story behind after the run is I did lose a lot of weight. I've been a runner all my life, mm -hmm. but two years ago I found myself in a situation where I was way out of shape. I was over 300 pounds and morbidly obese. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I, I finally said enough is enough. I made some changes in my life. And when I went out on the trail to run, you know, it started where I couldn't run at all. Um, you know, I was running a few steps, walking a few steps, sweating a lot. Right. <laughs> but as I progressed, I found like, as I was running, that's where I would get my best ideas for life and for business. And mm -hmm. so I started just recording those in my phone for as like journal entries. And then after doing that for a few months, I thought, man, I have so much good stuff come to me while I'm running. I should share that out. And so that's where the podcast came from is when I get done with a long run, usually on the weekend, I'll record an episode just on the things that I've been learning that week. Oh, that's super cool. You know, I love podcasts. So one thing as an ultra distance runner. So now I run, I run, I just hit 200 kilometers for this month. So I'm running over 100 miles a month now. And that gives wow. me a lot of time to listen to things. So I listen to a lot of podcasts. I probably listen to 20 hours a week of podcasts. And I love shows like yours where I'm constantly learning and developing new ideas. So I'll, I'll pick a topic like right now I'm really into YouTube because I'm starting this virtual school assembly. So I'm listening to podcasts about how to do YouTube better. And it's so fun to get that education while I'm exercising. I, I feel like I'm always a student. And so uh, that's yeah. what I love about podcasts is you can do it from anywhere. I can do it when I commute to work. When I was commuting to work, actually, I'm, I'm driving today. It's right. an hour drive to my classroom. Uh, and I, I still go mm -hmm. once a week to film videos. So I'm ready for the fall. So um, I'll listen to podcasts on my drive. 
Yeah, that's cool. I don't get to do that. I've been bike riding or walking, running, mm-hmm. you know, to take place of driving, basically. <laughs> Great. But sometimes I'll need to like just go for a drive and I still do that just because that's the only thing I can do. I'm an extroverted person, mm-hmm. so I, I like to go and do things and right. this staying inside for so long is, is you know, starting I, to I <laughs> kind of understand. I'm actually an introvert and the last two months have been the best two months of my life. I, I've loved having time at home with my kids and working on projects. I it's This has been a wonderful time for me. Oh, that's awesome. I bet. So you, how did you, so since you said you've been a runner all your life, how did you wind up in a, in a, I mean, in a position where you were not, you know, you were out of shape, were you just busy? Like what happened there? Yeah, just like everyone else. Um, So the the average American today is 25 pounds heavier than we were 50 years ago. And it's because we have a culture of consumption. We eat and we eat foods that are craveable, right? So they're, they're engineered to make us hungry all the time. And so most adults in our country will gain during their adult life at least 25 pounds. So you're going to gain a pound to two pounds a year um, just from living. And so that was what's what's happening to me through my adult life. You know, after college, I was in great shape in college. I ran a few marathons and, and was doing some good things. And then every year I gained a few pounds. And after 20 years, that those few pounds had added up to over 100 pounds. And so during that time, I was still relatively active as far as um, physical activity. I still, I ran um, my last marathon prior to losing the weight. I ran a marathon at 280 pounds. So I was still running even though I was obese. Um, But then I did go through a period. I have a foot condition that means I'm in a lot of pain a lot of the time. And I stopped running to see if the foot condition would go away. It didn't. Um, And so I've just learned to deal with the pain. But during that time, that's where I kind of got even more out of shape and got over 300 pounds. Uh, And so that's where uh, I had to come to Jesus moment with my wife. And she said, we need to make some changes. And and that's where it's turned around for me. But no, I've been pretty active all my life. Um, I'm just a normal person. And so we gain weight as we get older. That's normal. Yeah. Yeah, I gotcha. My husband is fortunate enough to not have ever gained a pound in his entire life. (laughs) (laughs) And he and our daughter, um, both, they, they definitely, they have a higher metabolism rate than anybody else that I've ever met in my life. Mm -hmm. And they need, and he, you know, his argument is like, well, we need carbs, a lot of them, a lot of the time. And I'm like, you're not wrong. You clearly do. Cause they eat, I mean, they eat a constantly but like my daughter will pick at it and eat like a bird but then she'll come back two hours later and be hungry again but he does the same thing so you know when I have genetics staring me in the face I'm like I don't know what to do with you guys (laughs) yeah you know and the interesting thing about that so over the last two years I've done a ton of research on uh, on health and nutrition uh, and and what I've learned is Yes, you might win the genetic lottery and you might have a a high metabolism, but that doesn't mean that you're healthier. It means you look better. It means that you're skinnier. And so when people are skinny but eat crap or Mm -hmm. when people are skinny and they don't have to do this or that, they still need the same things in their body that we need. So we still have to be careful about getting enough fiber, having enough vitamins, and you might need supplements or things like that. Um, Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, it's just as hard to be a skinny person as it is to be a fat person because you're not aware because it's not obvious that you need certain things in your diet. And so Mm -hmm. they're affected in in different ways. The people that have the fast metabolism, they might have different aches and pains or, or issues because they're not getting the right things in their diet. And it's just not obvious because they're not looking to lose weight or anything. They're just eating what they're eating. So we all have our own (laughs) health and nutrition Mm -hmm. issues. Oh yeah. That is a very good point. I will 100% go downstairs in five minutes ish when I, or whenever we're done with this and be like, listen, this is why you're having stomach cramps all the time. This is why you can't go to the bathroom regularly. We need to talk. Right. You're not having carbs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's going to hate this. <laughs> yeah. But I do wish, man, I, my kids are skinny. They're bean poles and, and eat way more than I do. Even well, my, my teenagers eat more than I do. And, yeah. and I, and I'm jealous of that, you know, but they'll Same. they'll probably outgrow it because they have a lot of my genes in them, you know. So they'll, mm. as they get older, that, that metabolism will slow down. 
Yep. Yep. For sure. I know. I had a doctor try to tell me that my son who was, I think like 10 or 11 at the time was, was obese Mm -hmm. because he, because of his weight, but he was basing the weight based off of the age chart or whatever. Yeah. Your BMI, which is a joke. Right. Thank you. (laughs) And he was proportionate because he is a giant, a legitimate, like he is in the hundredth percentile for his age range and has been since the day he was born. So, I mean, it's, he's just a giant. Yeah. Well, and, and so I'm glad you brought that up. That's a a common thing. And it's a frustrating thing for everyone, not just for the medical profession. A lot of people Mm -hmm. map health to your weight and to BMI. And you can see me, we're on this zoom call and I'm a big guy. So I, I still weigh, I'm about 220 pounds. And Mm -hmm. on the BMI charts, I'm still considered morbidly obese, even though my body fat percentage is 17%, which is extremely athletic. Uh, And so obviously those two things don't correlate, but we get so caught up in our culture on the scale, right? We see the scale. And even me, you know, after I lost 100 pounds, I got down under 200. And then last year I gained 20 pounds. And I was so embarrassed about it. I didn't post on social media. I didn't, you know, even my my uh, podcast after the run, I didn't do episodes for a really long time because I was like, I'm doing everything right. I'm eating healthy. I'm still exercising like crazy, but I'm gaining all this weight. Well, it wasn't until just a few weeks ago, I sat down and looked at the numbers. I lost five pounds of fat last year. I lost 5% body fat, but I gained 30 pounds of muscle. And so I'm, right? I'm way healthier now, but according to those BMI charts, my health went through a steep decline over the last year, which is not true. It's not right at all. Right. I wish they would redo that then because yeah, when he told me that I didn't, I didn't really listen to him because I'm like, his body is proportionate. Mm -hmm. He clearly is not overweight. And if you look at his height and weight, um, you know, even now it says that he is technically on the BMI chart, um, obese, but if you look at his height and weight for a 16 year old, he's perfectly normal. Right. And that's why I'd say that one of the good measurements of your health would be to find out what your body fat percentage is and body fat percentage for teenagers and kids is different than what you're looking at for adults. And so you, Mm -hmm. you know, you stack those up differently, but that is a good indicator of your actual overall health. Um, You can also do that by taking certain measurements. So, you know, if your gut size is big, like for your age or whatever, that's usually a a bad sign. So even big boned people like me, if your waist is, you know, my waist got up to 46 inches, I was unhealthy. That was bad. (laughs) But, But that is a good measurement. That's a better measurement than weight is looking at you know, your, your chest size, your waist size, things yeah. like that. Yeah. I, um, I was anorexic for a little bit whenever I was in middle school and I, I got sick, really mm-hmm. sick. And so <laughs> I decided not to do that anymore, obviously, cause it wasn't really helping me in the long run. But as an adult, I've learned that if I look at a scale, I'll obsess about it. And right. so I just don't anymore. I'm like, do my pants fit? How do they fit? Do I need new pants? And that's how mm-hmm. I basically measure it now. <laughs> that is a good measurement. Yeah. <laughs> And especially in quarantine, I think that's, uh, we should just try on our jeans every now and again, guys. <laughs> yeah. Don't live in sweatpants. That's a bad way to live. Right. Life. Yeah. <laughs> Cause your sweatpants will lie to yep. you. <laughs> yep. So you've been teaching now and doing the YouTube mm-hmm. channel and your book is coming out at some point. Tell me about the, the TEDx talk that you did. Yeah. Um, I was really excited. So 2020 for me was supposed to be epic. We, I, I had done all these cool things in 2019 and I was starting to get invited onto stages to share my message of, of weight loss, but also of productivity because um, I've published other books too. And so I've done a lot in the last few years. And so as I started to get invited to speak on podcasts and in high school assemblies and things like that, I really, I didn't know that like professional speaking was a thing, but some friends told me about, you know, you can actually get paid to give speeches. And so I started looking into that. And as I did that, one thing that was common throughout like learning how to be a professional speaker was there are two things to really speed up your process. One is a TED talk and the other is writing a book. Well, I'd already written books, and so I didn't need to do that, but I started investigating TED Talks and how to land a TED Talk and which ones would be the best fit, and so I actually reached out. They didn't come to me. I reached out to a bunch of different TED events, and I specifically did it 
for March because that was my spring break. I wouldn't have to take time off work. And so I looked at a bunch of different events and had three that were interested in, in having me share my story. And so I found one that was a youth TED event so I could talk to kids because that's that's my sweet spot. I, I like to talk to students. And so I had arranged to, to go to San Francisco to share uh, my message, which is about, it, it's the topic is brain boost. And I talk about how exercising activates your brain and in, improves your memory, improves how you learn things. So both your short-term and your long-term memory and makes you a better student. So if you want to have more success in the classroom, one of the best things you can do is be active. And so I talk about how in my classroom, I'm a fifth grade teacher, how we regularly take breaks throughout the day to dance, to do other exercises. Uh, I go out to recess with my students. I go to PE with my students uh, so that we're doing these physical things together because it makes us better students. It makes us more productive. Uh, and so my TED Talk talked about all the research behind that, why we learn so much better when we're physically active, which is a good message right now for quarantine. You know, it's really hard to be active when you're stuck at home. Um, mm -hmm. but you can do push-ups, you can do sit-ups. Um, when my kids were learning from home, we would every day at 9.30 come to the dungeon, to our basement, and we would turn on the TV and um, we have a Wii and we would play Just Dance. And we'd do it for a half hour. We'd have contest dance competitions every day at 9.30. And it was one of my favorite parts of this whole quarantine situation is we're dancing together, so we're having fun. But it's also getting us through the drudgery of the morning of doing the work. And so we'd work for an hour, hour and a half. We'd take a break for a few minutes then we'd get back to work and we would be more productive because our, our brains were stimulated from that exercise. You have more oxygen and blood in your brain. You're going to learn better. You're going to be more alert. Uh, and so that's what my TED Talk's about. I was sad that I wasn't able to share it, but I'm sure I'll get on a TED stage eventually. Right. Yeah, of course. Well, I, that is a very good uh, lesson. I also saw somewhere where somebody said that um, the people who make basketball goals have sold more since quarantine than they had <laughs> in the past like year combined. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, that's... That's good. I'm yeah. Glad. <laughs> well, and it's on my show. So next week is is NBA week. I have four or five guests that play in the NBA, and they haven't been mm -hmm. um, obviously playing at, or with their teams at all. But as I've talked to them, yeah. you, you know, a lot of them have really amped up their own training as they're stuck at home and can't go to the gym. Even professional athletes are taking advantage of this time to get in better shape uh, because they see the mm -hmm. benefits right now being in good physical health is going to correlate very highly with our mental health. And there are going to be some major mm -hmm. issues that come out of this social isolation in regards to mental health. But way, one way to yeah. combat that is making an extra effort at home to exercise. Absolutely. And since my husband has been home, I've been able to do that. He um, is going to go to work next week for a week, for just a week. And mm -hmm. I'm dreading that. Hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because as it stands right now in the afternoon at like between noon and two, you know, I'll go out and do my own thing. So that, and he'll just be here with the kids. But. Right. Yeah. It's It's been an adventure learning how to shuffle kids and schedules and, and do things at home. But I, I again, I think this is a real opportunity to learn new things and develop new skills and, and figure out what works for you in a different environment. So it's been an opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. So you have started multiple businesses as well in the past, but you mentioned that those were on hold right now. Mm -hmm. How did you, do you do web design or do you just own the firm? Uh, both. So, and I am not actively seeking clients anymore and probably never will again. Um, I okay. learned to do design when I was in college. And so I learned coding and I know like the old school, um, how to build a website from the ground mm -hmm. up. Um, mm -hmm. It's super easy. Anyone can build their own website now just by watching YouTube videos and getting a free Google site or a Wix page or whatever. Web yeah. design is so easy. Um, but about 10 years ago, because I'm a school teacher during the summers, I had time. And so I started, I've, I've always done websites for friends and family, stuff like that. But I thought I should actually make some money doing this. So in, in a branding play, I reached out to a bunch of celebrities and ask them if I could build their websites for free. And I really just spent one day researching who are all my favorite actors and singers and stuff like that. I tried to 
this was in the early days of Facebook. So I tried to reach them through social media um, or if I could find an email address for them or something. And then I just did an email blast to a bunch of people, forgot about it. And after like six months, um, one of my favorite actors, his name's uh, Sage Brocklebank, and he was on the show Psych. Um, Mm -hmm. He was the junior detective Buzz McNabb. So he's one of the funny little side actors. And he, out of the blue, contacted me and said, hey, I just found this message in like my archives in Facebook that, that you're doing web design. I'd love to have a website. And so I started working with him. I built him a site and actually became really good friends with him. We've worked on a bunch of projects now together uh, and I've helped him start his business and we've done different things together. But um, I built him a website and then he referred me to some other acting friends. Uh, So I I did one for Patrick Sabongi, who's on The Flash and Mm -hmm. uh, a few other people, a model and, and really built up my portfolio And what that did for me was take me to the next tier as far as pricing. So then I can say, look, I've done celebrity websites. And then mom and pop shops would still come to me. But instead of charging $1,000 for a website, I could charge $5,000 for a website. Mm -hmm. And so I did that. And I made a decent amount of money doing web design during my summers. Um, But I have found that there are other things now that I'm way more passionate about. So I haven't given up my old clients, but I'm not taking on any new ones. Right. Yeah, that totally makes sense. So do you still do the national recruiting service as well? Similar thing. So yes, uh, I, (laughs) that story started a little differently. I was teaching an educational technology class and I was telling my students the benefits of blogging. Uh, This was back probably before we even called them blogs. It was basically why you should have your own website and teach people stuff on it. And now they're Mm. called blogs and anyone can have one for free. But as I was telling my students about this, I I told them some of the things I had done in the past and how I'd been able to share what I was learning about personal finance and and other things in education. And they said, well, okay, Mr. C, what are you blogging about right now? And I wasn't. And I I was really embarrassed about that. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to find something else I'm passionate about and I'm going to start a new blog. So I did that. And I started blogging about my favorite college football team. And that blog, over time, I I was real consistent. I'd wake up at four o'clock every day and do a blog post every day. And after a year, I had quite a following. That blog now has over a million page views. And I started getting requests to be on other people's blogs. The largest newspaper in the state asked me to become a recruiting expert for them and to write newspaper articles. I started getting media passes to go to football games and be on the, the field with the players. And so I had these cool opportunities. And while I was doing that, I realized that I was in a unique position to help kids in high school land scholarships to go to college. And so I started a, a site called D1 Recruiting, where I help kids understand the recruiting process. What I was learning as I was blogging about my own favorite football team, I was putting those lessons learned up on the site. So I I had information and then I was posting profiles for students who wanted more exposure uh, and helping them with the recruiting process. I wrote a book about how to contact college coaches and and so it was really mostly an information site, but I had that service base where I would do profiles for students. Again, that's all on hold now. Uh, I still have the website and people are still using it. I think my Twitter following there is like 15,000 and people keep joining, even though I'm not creating any new content. Um, yeah. But it's just to help students. You know, I want kids to get to college as a professor and as a teacher. I see the value mm-hmm. in getting a, a, a further education. Um, Even though with my own kids, you know, if they choose not to go to college, I'm totally okay with that. But the social benefits and the development that happens in college is something I want for all kids. And so that's why I created D1 Recruiting. It's still alive and kicking, but I'm not actively growing it. Yeah, that's why I push college on my kids too, is strictly for the social, like there are, there are people who make friends in college and, you know, wind up working together 20 and 30 years later, Mm -hmm. you know, but they were friends all that time. So they know that they have that trust there and there's just relationships and bonds in college that I believe are built, you know, as you go into adulthood, that's going to be harder to find. Right. Yeah. With my kids, I think, you know, my, my kids are brilliant. They're good. They can go to any college they want to. They're, they're really accomplished. You know, my, my 10 year old daughter published her first book. My 14 year old has started his own businesses and, Mm. and they're really ambitious, but if they choose not to go to college, the part of me that will lament that is the idea that when you're in your twenties, 
you really want to surround yourself with other people who are being productive and you are more likely to find them at a college campus than you are in a bar, you know? And so that's one thing that as a parent, I can encourage them to, to look towards college. Um, and I don't care if it's Ivy league, MIT, my son wants to go to MIT. I don't care if it's MIT or a public or a junior college, just being Mm -hmm. in that environment around people who are trying to make something out of their lives. That's a really good idea. Yeah, I completely agree. I went to college when I was older. I think I was 28 whenever I started technically on my degree and I did it all online, but I still did. Like I became president of the honor society. And then I also volunteered as one of the student members of the board on that international honor society so that I was able to sit on the board and travel with the society and things like that. And we did all kinds of things that were online, but we still did it as a group. Mm -hmm. And like I had other officers that, you know, we held fundraisers, you know, for kids and stuff like that. And so, I mean, it's still, I still talk to all those people. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's fantastic. Yeah. So even at any age, I mean, honestly, just college as an adult period is a fantastic way to, like you said, surround yourself with productive people that, you know, might have similar goals to what you have. Mm-hmm. So absolutely. That's a great point. Yep. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to cover? (laughs) We've covered a lot. (laughs) You know, so this is the teachable soul. And I think the message here, I I am a school teacher, but I'm also a student first. I'm always learning. And I think what we've gotten through this episode is that we can continue to learn and grow no matter what the circumstance, uh, no matter Mm -hmm. what phase in life we're at, we're in a position to learn. And so I, I really hope that that's the message that you're, you're, um, listeners are getting out of this is if you make yourself teachable, if you, if you decide to be a student, you know, the opportunities are endless, especially right now where you can create content, where you can develop new skills. Um, we're in such an, a fantastic time in the world where the possibilities are endless. And so as long as you're willing to learn, there is so much that you can do and accomplish. Yep, absolutely. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming on to share that message. I really appreciate it. And I think it's an important one. That's great. Yeah, my pleasure. You have been listening to the Teachable Soul podcast. You can find us on any social media platform, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram as the Teachable Soul or on Twitter as Teachable Soul. Also, if you'd like to help support the show, you can find us at patreon.com slash the Teachable Soul. You can also visit our website for more information at theteachablesoul.com. 